Got my Irish Red Ale here. Just finished the first one. And I've already walked away thinking Thomas Cochran is a ballsy son of bitch. And Cochran against Napoleon. Okay. I don't understand why they're battling for a road. There's no roads in the ocean. <laughs> Stupid people. Video. <laughs> By 1801, the young Lord Thomas Cochrane had won many battles, proving himself an exemplary warrior and passionate leader. But it would be this next chapter of his life that would see his fateful rise to legend and his ultimate fall from grace. Oh, don't Welcome say that. to part two of our series on the life of Thomas Cochrane which will examine how he earned a title bestowed upon him by Napoleon himself and his hard-headed defiance against authority. Shout out to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. We're happy to be partners with Brilliant as this educational platform and our channel share similar little smarter. On July 18th, 1801, Thomas Cochrane stood aboard the deck of the 80-gun HMS Pompey to face a military court for the capture of HMS Speedy. This guy right here reminds me of like a French version of George Washington. However, he knew that the slew of unlikely mm -hmm. victories he had won on his little sloop outweighed the cost of its eventual loss. Sure enough, Cochrane was honorably acquitted. With that out of the way, he had expected three things a swift promotion to post-captain, a shiny new frigate to command, and a return to the bountiful fame of Napoleonic warfare. Unfortunately, none of this would come to pass. The Royal Navy brass dragged their feet, and for three months he watched rival officers get promoted ahead of him. Although he was finally appointed post-captain on August 8th, he had become resentful towards the British Admiralty, publicly berating the Lord Admiral St. Vincent, an act which would earn him ire from the aristocratic oligarchy that was British Naval Command. Did they not promote him based on him being a prisoner and being released and maybe it was viewed as him being paroled so he wasn't able to enter? Stop. Is that... Well, they didn't say he was paroled in the, the first one when he was released. But I'm just kind of wondering if that was maybe their, their view on it. On May 18th, 1803, Britain declared war on Napoleonic France once more. Cochrane, who had been unemployed during a year-long truce, was delighted to finally be deployed. Unfortunately, his ill-advised aggressions had come back to haunt him, as the vengeful Lord St. Vincent saw to it that the new post-captain was stiffed again. Cochrane was appointed to command the HMS Arab, a destitute sixth-rate frigate which he equated to a flat-bottomed cargo hauler rather than a Royal Navy warship, lamenting that she would sail like a haystack. For the next year, Cochrane was relegated to patrolling Northern Europe, remarking that it was literally naval exile in a tub. However, in May 1804, St. Vincent was replaced by Lord Melville, who had more appreciation for Cochrane's achievements, and in autumn gave Cochrane command of a vessel worthy of his talents, the HMS Palace. She was a brand new, top-of-the-line, fifth-rate Thames-class frigate, armed with 36 cannons. Her deck was nearly twice as long as the HMS Speedy, and had a crew capacity thrice as large. Pallas was a sleek weapon of destruction. By the turn of 1806, HMS Pallas had become an infamous menace to both France and Spain. In one cruise along the Azor Islands, she had captured four Spanish treasure galleons heavily laden with New World silver, what? depriving the Spanish treasury of millions of dollars worth of capital. Oh. Cochrane was then deployed to the coasts around the Bay of Biscay, where he harried a dozen more French vessels. Pallas's most noteworthy action came on the 5th of April, 1806. Cochrane heard word of a squadron of French corvettes anchored down the estuary of the Garonne River. 
the waters and coastline did not make open battle favourable. Thus, Cochrane waited patiently for nightfall and anchored his frigate at the mouth of the river estuary. From there, he appointed his lieutenant, John Haswell, to take 180 of his crewmen and embark upon the boarding boats, rowing up river along the shoreline under cover of darkness. Sure enough, this boarding party came upon a ship at anchor, Tapageus, a 14-gun corvette serving as a guard ship for the rest of the French vessels upstream. At 3am, the crew of the palace launched themselves upon Tapageus, catching the Frenchmen by surprise. After a brief but fierce skirmish, the British sailors prevailed, inducing the enemy's surrender. Yet things were soon to go sideways, for the shouts and musket fire from the melee had alerted the vessels up the river. Before Lieutenant Haswell was able to weigh Tapajus's anchor and return to the palace, his men were intercepted by another French gun brig. A broadsight gunfight ensued, in which Haswell managed to use the captured vessel's cannon to subdue the foe. Despite this, the prize ship suffered damage to her rigging, stranding the majority of British seamen upriver. At sunrise, the crew remaining aboard the palace itself spotted three French corvettes bearing down upon them from the coastline. Cochrane was now vulnerable, as the majority of his men were still with Haswell far upstream. At full capacity, Pallas could potentially outgun three corvettes, but with only a paltry 40 men on her deck, it was a hopeless fight. Thinking quickly, Cochrane ordered his skeleton crew to fasten rope yarns to the furled sails. Then, in one motion, all the yarns were cut at once, loosing all sail in one go, giving off the illusion that Pallas was manned by a full crew. In Cochrane's own words, the maneuver succeeded to a marvel. No sooner was our cloud of canvas thus suddenly let fall than the approaching vessels hauled the wind and ran off along shore. Um, Pallas engaged in They might have thought it was a skeleton crew, and they'd just creep on up, take a look, and maybe take the ship. But when that move happened, they were probably just as scared as Cochrane was with the, the crew that was the skeleton crew on board. It was, oh, I hope they take off, and they did. Oh, come on. Really? Really? ...to man, unbeknownst to the French captain. Why would I have muted it? Piece of shit. Pallas engaged in pursuit, blasting her bow guns into the stern of the first fleeing corvette. <clears throat> These were the only guns they had the ability to man, unbeknownst to the French captain, who deliberately ran his vessel aground upon the shore in a panic, the shock of the impact collapsing the vessel's mainmast. With one ship subdued, the vicious Cochrane relentlessly pursued the remaining two corvettes. Both ran themselves aground and wrecked their vessels rather than risk battle with Pallas. Overall, with only one frigate and a handful of boarding boats, Cochrane and his men had decommissioned four French warships and captured one, it was a stunningly unlikely victory, won through iron will and quick wit. In the summer of 1806, Cochrane returns to Britain as a triumphant war hero, his fearless raids off the Bay of Biscay having earned him no small amount of fame. Napoleon himself, the newly crowned Emperor of France, had taken an interest in this particularly prolific captain's trail of destruction and personally ordered his capture, bestowing upon him a new title, Le Lou de Mer, the Sea Wolf. Never one to rest on his laurels, Cochrane was far from finished with his seaborne marauding. In August of 1806, he was appointed to the HMS Imperieuse, a sturdy 38 cannon frigate that was significantly more powerful than Pallas. Imperieuse soon became an icon of glory for the British Navy and a consistent scourge to France. It would be in 1808 when Cochrane hit his stride once more off the coasts of Spain. This was a year when the British army was embroiled in a desperate land struggle across the Iberian Peninsula against their Napoleonic foe, and Cochrane's naval contributions to the war effort were invaluable. The writings of contemporary novelist Sir Walter Scott emphasize as much, claiming the captain had, with his single ship, kept the whole coast of Long Dock in alarm, 
destroyed telegraphs of utmost importance to the French, preventing troops being sent from that province into Spain, and excited such dismay that 2,000 men were drawn from Figueras to oppose him, men who otherwise would have been marching further into the peninsula. Despite his success, Cochrane continued to lament upon the lack of recognition he received from the British Admiralty, often claiming in his autobiography that they not only failed to give him any praise, but in fact cheated him and his crew out of their rightfully earned prize money. In I would just say that it's just jealousy, more than likely, and... I'm going to, as an American, I apologize to non-Americans out there, but I have to relate things to what I know. And I'm going to go to Ulysses S. Grant in the Civil War, his battle of, let me see, he took, um, wow, the two forts. The names have just completely... Uh, Fort Donaldson, Vicksburg. Fort Donaldson and Vicksburg? Oh, I hope I killed you. Um, I want to say it was that. Anyways, and, and even Shiloh. <clears throat> Although I think Shiloh a little less. He, uh... Now I can't even think... My... my mind today has just been off but anyways um, the commander in charge of him and even all the way up to McClellan tried to take credit for the things that Grant had done during those two fort sieges and it's it's no different people want credit and recognition and love and admiration and affection and attention I had to burp. They want those things sometimes for things that they didn't do just to say, no, 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 I gave them permission. Right. You gave them permission. It doesn't mean you came up with the plan. So I can totally see this as being just jealousy of someone who was successful and had been known to be a gambler in a way, and they didn't like it or, or they wanted the, the credit for it. June, the Imperieuse sailed for Mongat, a Catalonian fortress under the occupation of French troops under General Duchesne. With the help of Catalan guerrillas, he launched a two-pronged assault on the coastal battery, capturing it soundly. He would later go on to seize and decipher French... Apologies, but I have to pause it for this. Cookies and cream porter. That is going to be shit. I am not happy about this one. I had the peanut butter porter, gave me heartburn, followed by hazelnut porter, gave me heartburn. This is gonna be the same son of a bitch. I'm unhappy right now. All right. Code books and occupy Fort Trinidad, causing invaluable losses in French manpower, intelligence, resources, and time. Smells like it. To many among friend and foe, the sea wolf had become larger than life, more vengeful spirit than man. It was this reputation that would see him conscripted into the largest fleet engagement of his life, Ugh. a contest that would serve as the climax to his naval boldness oh. and the peak of his hubris, the Battle of Basque Roads. Oh. In spring of 1809, a Royal Navy fleet was being hastily assembled by one Admiral Gambia in order to confront a French flotilla that had escaped a British blockade in Brest and now lay anchored in the well-protected mouth of the River Charente, a region known as Basque Roads. The French intention was to escape into the open Atlantic and harry British interests in the West Indies, which the British under no circumstances could allow. To this end, the Admiralty directly sought out its most dauntless post-captain. Cochrane's reputation as a maverick made using him a risky gamble, but his daring nature and unquestionable naval genius were exactly what the Royal Navy needed to complete the total destruction of the French Atlantic fleet. At the Palace of Whitehall, Cochrane met with First Admiral Lord Mulgrave, who asked for the Scotsman's personal advice. 
the idea of using fire ships was put on the table, and Cochrane insisted that the plan would only work if supplemented by ships laden with explosives and rockets to further eliminate the enemy's ability to resist amidst fire and chaos. Yeah. Satisfied with this plan, Lord Mulgrave ordered Cochrane to join Admiral Gambia's fleet at Basque Roads and personally lead the fire ship's charge. This dismayed the Scotsman, who personally despised Admiral Gambia, believing him to be the exact breed of corrupt aristocrat who had so often hampered his career. Despite his insistence, Mulgrave would not rescind the order, and Cochrane begrudgingly sailed Imperius to join the British war fleet. Cochrane arrived at Basque Roads on April 3rd, and found his suspicions of Admiral Gambia had proven to hold warrant. Gambia was a vacillating commander, an evangelical Christian who insisted on distributing religious tracts to his men, making them study them rather than actively planning an attack. The arrival and appointment of Lord Cochrane as head of the coming assault did not help matters. One Admiral Sir Eliab Harvey was enraged that he had been snubbed of the role in place of a junior officer, and fiercely denounced Gambia, calling him a psalm slinger as well as claiming, I never saw a man so unfit for the command of the fleet. If Admiral Nelson were here, he would not have anchored in Basque Roads at all, but would have dashed the enemy at once. Harvey had been the captain of the HMS Temeraire. He was a hero of the Battle of Trafalgar, yet he was sent to London and court-martialed all the same. His departure was an ill omen for the British fleet. The two... It's commercial time. What are you doing today to change your mood? Me? 30 Killing minutes some... ago? I've taken this cannabis infused edible. Oh, I just murdered you. someone, so. It's fantastic. We, we, do, we differ on what to do. The two fleets stood nine miles apart from one another in an indefinite standoff. The French column, commanded by Admiral Zachary Almont, was comprised of 11 ships of the line and four frigates, organized into two rows wedged between the tiny Ile d'Aix and the perilous shallow Boyard Shoal. Furthermore, a fortified garrison, complete with operational gun batteries, sat firmly on the island's northern edge. With both sides inaccessible to the British vessels, the French had secured their flanks and were firmly wedged in. Realizing there was no time to waste, Cochrane asked for permission to convert the transport ships in Gambia's fleet into fire ships and explosive vessels, which was granted. Three explosion vessels were prepared, their holds packed with 1,500 barrels of gunpowder stuffed into casks and tied together, supplemented by 3,000 hand grenades, all tied to a long fuse lit from the ship's stern giving its brave crew around 15 minutes to scuttle off in a lifeboat before the big detonation. Eight more prepared fire vessels arrived on April 10th, sent by Lord Melville. Having prepared his deadly squadron of suicidal vehicles, Cochrane asked Gambia for permission to begin the attack post-haste and charge straight for the French line. Gambia refused, denouncing the Scotsman's head-on tactics as sheer foolhardiness this infuriated Cochrane, who countered that further delay would lead to the French Admiral doubtlessly catching on to the fireship plan and putting safeguards in place, inevitably leading to the loss of more British lives. Sure enough, the next morning's sun revealed the existence of a massive boom that barricaded the narrow channel between the fortress at Dix and the Boyard Shoal. Furthermore, Admiral Almol had in fact been made aware of the British fire ships, and had ordered the front row of his ships of the line to point forward to present a smaller target. Seventy canoes were deployed to wait by the boom, equipped- How was he informed about the fire ships? Sounds like there is a spy with towing lines so as to tug any approaching fire ships out of harm's way, while the French frigates too sailed ahead of the fleet to guard the harbour chain against British incursions. As day turned to dusk on April 11th, the winds began to churn, turning the coastal seas into a choppy tempest. 
It was at this time that Gambia finally approved the fireship's assault, perhaps taking advantage of the poor conditions to discourage Cochrane. Nevertheless, the Sea Wolf was undeterred and pressed forward with his plan. His crew was made up purely of volunteers, as fireships fell outside the conventional boundaries of warfare, and sailors captured by the enemy while operating them would not be taken prisoner, but instead executed. Ooh. At around 8pm, three explosive ships barreled down towards the French boom, taking advantage of the flood tide. One was captained by Frederick Mayat, one of Cochrane's most trustworthy officers, while the Sea Wolf captained one himself, taking the lead. At around half past eight, Cochrane determined that his floating bomb was around ten minutes away from the boom. He commanded his crew immediately proceed to the lifeboats to evacuate, and personally lit the fuse, creating a countdown for his vessel's imminent explosion. Together they boarded the dinghy and rowed vigorously against the currents to get out of range of the incoming blast, only to discover about a hundred yards out that they had left their mascot dog on board. Refusing to let his pooch get blown up, Cochrane rowed back for the floating time bomb, climbed aboard, grabbed the dog, and jumped back into the dinghy, once more rowing away with extra vigour. Soon, the floating bomb hit the boom, and a massive explosion illuminated the night sky, a veritable fireworks display of destruction. The explosive vessel was torn apart, and in turn shredded the massive chain that stood between the Royal Navy and its foe. Ten minutes later, Mayat's vessel collided with what remained, creating a second eruption which scattered the French canoes that had been waiting to tow away the attackers. This annihilation completely dumbfounded Admiral Almont, for fireships were one thing, but in no world could he imagine his opponent creating explosive vessels, a monstrosity that disregarded every convention of civilized warfare. The third explosion vessel had run aground and been put out of commission, but the way was now cleared and it was time for the inferno. At 9.30 pm, 20 British fireships began their way down the channel. The French frigate Vanguard quickly cut their anchor lines and fled hastily back towards the main fleet. Yet the fireships soon encountered trouble. The choppy currents made their navigation perilous, causing many captains to panic then light and abandon their ships too early, causing the burning husks to drift harmlessly into the shoals on either side of the channel. However, the stormy sea worked too in the British favour, rendering the waters too perilous for their French foes to manoeuvre. Of 20 fire ships, four managed to make it into the French anchorage, and from there, chaos was the order of the night. A flaming vessel latched onto the 74-gun Regulus, causing the ship of the line to crash into its fellow French Tourville. Several more ships were set alight as rockets flared chaotically across wooden decks. Men drowned diving overboard to escape the flames, creating a scene of panic incarnate. By daybreak... The best part of Christmas is basically the presents. They always hide it in the same exact place. I kind of want it to be a surprise, but I kind of want to know too. I act like I never saw anything. That's why you call being sneaky. I'm standing in front of my heat track system. The minute it starts to snow or freezing rain, plug them in. I have not shoveled in. Shut up. Shut up. By daybreak, it was revealed that of 14 French ships, all but two had been damaged and run aground on the nearby mudflats in an attempt to evade the fires, rendered completely immobile. Cochrane had since made it back to the Imperieuse and knew that the time to strike was now, when the enemy was trapped and helpless. Yet Admiral Gambier refused to give the order. Cochrane was floored with disbelief unable to comprehend how a man with 11 battleships and 7 frigates at his disposal refused to engage an enemy who at current had only two operational vessels. By noon, the Océan and four other French ships had been put back afloat and were retreating deep into the mouth of the River Charente. 
Knowing that total victory was slipping out between his fingers, Cochrane committed an act of blatant insubordination, launching HMS Imperieuse deep into the Gulf alone to take on the entire French fleet single-handedly, saying later in his own words, it was better to risk the frigate, or even my commission, than suffer a disgraceful termination to the expectations of the Admiralty. Imperius engaged the beached vessel Calcutta, with the two warships exchanging deadly broadsides, with the British frigate at an immense advantage. Simultaneously, Cochrane ordered his bow and stern cannons fired into the Aquilon and Ville de Varsovie, respectively. Beached they may have been, but a single frigate was still engaged in a duel with three ships of the line twice its size. Soon, the Calcutta surrendered and was captured by Cochrane's crew. It was at this point that Gambia finally sent some backup into the channel, unable to let one impetuous captain take on the entire French navy. Five frigates and two ships of the line entered Basque Roads. Calcutta was abandoned and set aflame while the Aquila and Ville de Varsovie quickly surrendered. A fourth ship, Tonnerre, was scuttled by its own crew. The Battle of Basque Roads was undoubtedly a victory for the Royal Navy, who had sunk three French ships of the line, a fourth rate and a frigate, all while losing only 30 men and no ships of their own. However, wow. had Gambia shown any initiative, the entire French Atlantic fleet could have been destroyed in the space of the morning whereas now the majority of it would live to fight another day. Cochrane remained infuriated by Admiral Gambia's incompetence, and upon returning to England, publicly shamed him for his conduct. Defiance in the face of authority... Publicly shaming your superior probably isn't going to work out the way you want it to. It's just, uh, yeah, it's not good. It was nothing new to Cochrane, but never before had he been so enraged or so viciously ripped into the personal character of such a powerful, well-connected man. Yep. Gambia demanded a court-martial to determine his innocence. Naturally, the tribunal was stacked with aristocrats sympathetic to him, and the admiral was exonerated from all wrongdoing, while Cochrane, known for his impudence, had suffered a dire blow to his reputation. This incident compelled Cochrane to refuse further naval appointments, and from 1809 onwards, the Wolf of the Sea focused on his career as a member of the British Parliament. Indeed, Cochrane had pursued political ambitions since 1806, when he'd first been elected as a representative of the Rising of Honiton, and later Westminster, acting as MP concurrently with his naval service. He used his position to campaign for hard naval reforms, becoming an outspoken critic of the corruption in the Royal Navy. The following years saw Cochrane's popularity increased with the common people, as he continued to relentlessly campaign against the aristocrats. Yet, he had few friends in Parliament, and near none amongst the Lordship and Admiralty. In 1814, Cochrane was implicated in a great stock exchange fraud, accused of deliberately misleading the public about Napoleon's death to increase the value of his government securities shares. Uh -oh. Naturally, the young lord protested his innocence, but his words fell deaf upon the courts, who had likely been bought out by his many shadowy enemies, acting vindictively upon him for his attempts to disrupt their status quo. As punishment for his alleged fraud, Cochrane was dishonorably expelled from Parliament and formally discharged from the Royal Navy, an institution he had won countless victories for. His honours were revoked, and he was sentenced to 12 months in jail. It was there, in the dour walls of King's Bench Prison, that this chapter of the Sea Wolf's story came to an end. Join us next episode to discuss... Wow. Oh, I'm getting tired of this gnat. I'd burn this goddamn house down just to kill that gnat. That's how I feel. All right. Join us for episode three of Thomas Cochran, the giant penis man who just took on the world, apparently. So I'm going to call it. All right. Like and subscribe. Because if you don't, then I don't have to drink this whole thing. And it is terrible. Terrible.
Um, imagine I just said something really like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that. 